Hi everyone and welcome to the Watchdog Live. My name is Taylor Hudak and we are in London covering Julian Assange's full extradition hearing. I am joined right now by my co-host Tarika Dodd and special guests Sarah Mabrook, Nathan Fuller, and Kevin Gastala. Um, I know, Tarek, that you were able to be present in the courtroom today. Uh, today was the third day of the extradition hearing. Remember, it began on Monday the 24th. Uh, so, Tarek, I will hand it off to you to kind of summarize what happened these past few days. Sure. Uh, firstly, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so, yeah, we started off on Monday, and we kind of heard the prosecution's um, version of events and laying out the charges, and we started to hear from the defense and kind of pushing back against uh, some of those charges made and we'll get into some of those and then today we got into specifically more about the um, specifics of the extradition uh, treaty between the United States and the UK. I think uh, all, all four of us here except for Taylor were in court today. It was a kind of a, a long slog of a day where um, you know everyone was kind of battling to keep up with with all the Drill demons. Case <laughs> <off>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, I mean, let's put it out to you guys. Um, so it was, you know, a lot of law, but um, what was kind of interesting or what jumped out for you guys in terms of what, uh, what took place today? Yeah, so it was all about the 2003 US-UK extradition treaty and um, Julian Assange is being extradited under this treaty, but the government, the US government, uh, which has a CPS prosecutor uh, in court here in London, um, is arguing that it should extradite him under this treaty, but actually he shouldn't receive certain rights under this treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, what was discussed today was largely about the political offense exception in that treaty. Um, the, it says that uh, the UK should not extradite uh, to the US for political offenses, of which the defense argues the Espionage Act is clearly a political offense, that anything against a head of state is, or a state is a clearly political offense. Um, but the government argues that even if it is, that doesn't matter, that the, US, that the UK should just rule under UK domestic law. And because the US-UK extradition treaty was ratified in the US, but not in the UK, that it shouldn't apply to Julian Assange. So the government wants to say that we can extradite him under this treaty, but he gets no rights from it. Mm -hmm. Any further thoughts on that in terms of, um, you know, that US is saying that this protection is not not going to be available to Julian, even though, you know, we heard in the court today that um, this protection was almost like a, a standard bearer across all um, extradition treaties across the world. I think we heard that it was in the UN's model extradition treaty. It was in the Interpol's um, conventions around extradition and the European Convention's uh, rulings around that. There was a moment, I believe, where the judge said something to the effect of, uh, you know, do you think Parliament not having this exception in the act somehow trumps the Magna Carta, which was kind of a jarring <laughs> moment when you think about it, because we were talking about arbitrary detention and whether what they're doing with Julian Assange is abusive. And we know the Magna Carta going back more than 800 years mm -hmm. now or close to 800 years now and uh, that basically is one of those things that gives citizens around the world those due process rights that mm -hmm. are valuable it's been a model for many different countries including the United States and for the judge to very casually ask the prosecution or sorry to ask the defense for this confirmation mm -hmm. uh it, it's a very startling moment but what struck me in these proceedings which we were very deep in the weeds of case law it's hard for you to follow because i mean i'm an american journalist so i don't know uk law but we have journalists from all over the world who don't who do not know british law or mm -hmm. or what is happening it's, it's in terms of the domestic law and uh, you could tell by the way that the prosecutor and the judge were working with each other that the, the prosecution was doing the bare minimum as they've been doing all week in making their rebuttals to the defense. But then the judge was already helping the prosecution before the prosecutor even started to give their response to the defense. So for example, uh, the defense started the morning 
talking about what constitutes political offenses, saying these are examples uh, that, that treason, sedition, and espionage are political offenses. They wanted to outline this case. They wanted to show how the indictment has political offenses. And she stopped the defense and said to them, I don't really care about that. I want to know why this is relevant to UK domestic law. I don't know why. I want to know why I should care that you believe there are political offenses because I don't think this actually matters as far as our law because we don't have to abide by the treaty. We can just abide by domestic law. So, Sarah, I want to get your thoughts in on this as well. Well, I know that uh, today there was discussion about the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty versus the extradition act. Can you talk about that and how it was presented in court? Um, Actually, I found it very confusing, (laughs) so I'm hoping that you can um, fill me in because there was something very confusing about the dates when the extradition treaty was actually ratified, which is in 2007, which is, as I understood, the same time that the act, there there was some sort of confusion about the act. I don't think you're alone in that at all. I think this is a point that has really uh, confused many people. So if we could all maybe discuss that a little bit or even discuss why this has been such a point of confusion for many people and many journalists in the courtroom. Yeah, so there's the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty, which was written in 2003, um, but it wasn't immediately ratified by both parties. Uh, But so it was written in 2003. It's the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty of 2003. Um, And in that same year, the U.K. domestically, the parliament passed uh, the Extradition Act of 2003. And so the treaty between the U.S. and the U.K. contains this exemption for a political offense, saying we can't extradite for a political offense, and that includes espionage and tradition, uh, sedition and treason and things like that. Um, but that exemption, which is uh, common in many extradition treaties around the world, uh, was not in the Act, and not in the domestic UK Act. Um, and so the government wants to argue that <clears throat> that, that should take precedence. Uh, so that was passed in, in 2003 in Parliament. Um, but in 2007, the US ratified the US-UK extradition treaty of 2003. Uh, it's definitely confusing, um, but uh, they did not remove the that bar, the provision that says you cannot extradite for political offenses. So the defense argues that that means that the U.S. and U.K. essentially agree that you shouldn't extradite for political offenses, even though this 2003 Domestic Act doesn't have that bar. It doesn't say that you shouldn't have the bar. It just is silent on the matter. I think it was interesting because the prosecution argued that um, the lack of this, def- uh, this, the lack of this protection, meant that Parliament had intended that this protection wasn't in place. But I think what the defence was saying is that actually, no, it was more of uh, just it was silent. It doesn't say whether this protection. I think that's just in, in order so it can be open because this, the 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 act is relevant for all countries, right? S- yeah. Right. So it's yeah. So I think there was you know that being done by the prosecution to. S- to kind of make the claim that this being absent was their way of indicating that they don't want this protection. And there was seemed to be very little pushback against that point. But I thought that, you know, that was specifically there. So it could be, um, you know, valid across different different countries. And the point that the the defense was making is that if there was a a treaty that kind of goes beyond the the act itself then the protections under the treaty if you if you are afforded more protections under the treaty than in the act it's the more generous version that's that's applied right and the u.s ratified this treaty um, and as the defense noted they did that because they don't want to extradite their own citizens but when it comes time to extradite one to the u.s the u.s has this request they say that they want they want it um no matter what, you know, they don't care about the political exemption or anything like that. So mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's actually polit- politically really dangerous. The U.S. gets to extradite as many people as it wants from the U.K. to the U.S., but so few the other way. I think it's something like 200 to 10, you know, the numbers are mm-hmm. uh, in favor of the U.S. I don't know how many people here are familiar. We talked about this a little bit earlier, yeah. the Harry Dunn case. Um, I don't know. If, have you heard of that at all? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Heard of it, not in, <laughs> not in detail, but definitely heard yeah, of it. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with it as I would like, but I believe that um, a British individual, Harry Dunn, was killed by a woman called um, Hannah Scatola, I believe. Um, I, c- 
can't, she's a US citizen, I, uh, but she was working for GCHQ um, after she um, um, killed this, I think it was a young 16 year old boy, I believe. Um, she's seeking asylum in the United States now, um, and you know, they're refusing to um, help with her extradition back to the UK. So that's kind of, and I think the defense for Julian Assange kind of alluded to this of how um, they're seeking extradition on one side, but then kind of when it's the flip that it's not being provided. Harry Dunn's family is very aware of this uh, mm -hmm. contradiction and have said that, uh, you know, if they're not going to send um, her this way, then Julian Assange shouldn't be sent to the U.S. And it's, yeah, very clear that there's a, a extreme power imbalance there. So uh, just to shift topics a little bit, just to backtrack to provide viewers with some uh, information, if you're just tuning in right now, this is the Watchdog Live. Uh, Kevin, I know that uh, Chelsea Manning is very much tied to this case as well, and you have reported extensively on her case. You've also been live tweeting uh, throughout the court hearings. So can you talk about how Chelsea Manning was brought up in court, not just even uh, today if she was, but I know yesterday she was. If you could talk about some of the revelations we learned about that as well. Yeah, yesterday Chelsea Manning was quite the focus. I'd say that she's irritated and, and vexes the prosecutors. We heard uh, the prosecutor, uh, James Lewis, say that you know, she had made a self-serving statement during the court-martial back in 2013. Uh, this statement is just the statement of a co-conspirator that she's constantly trying to further and, and help Julian Assange and that we shouldn't trust this statement but the defense is relying on it as, and these are their words, the best chronology for understanding Julian Assange's, uh, what happened with these disclosures to WikiLeaks. It's really the best record that we have publicly, but also it's clear that the defense is using it in order to guide their own uh, defense, uh, sorry, in, in order to guide their own rebuttals to what the prosecution uh, is putting forward. And the reason why it's such a problem for the prosecution is because Chelsea Manning's timeline does not match up with their timeline and also the arguments that they make about what Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning were doing together. Which, by the way, let's be clear, we have a source, Chelsea Manning, and we have Julian Assange, the journalist. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about a timeline of events between a source and a journalist, and, and they want to say, no, we actually have a timeline of events between a hacker and someone who's an insider, who WikiLeaks was recruiting and turning into a spy, who would go through databases that she was able to, to crack passwords to get into, or just had access, she could abuse her access, and then she could release these files. And the focus of their allegations is this most wanted leaks list from 2009 that has a bunch of different documents that most people have no idea what they are but they were uh, they were suggested based on the interest of journalists human rights activists people who were uh, involved in non-governmental organizations these were what governments were trying to conceal from the public at the time and they related to high profile events like wars that were unfolding conflicts um etc and they want to say that chelsea manning used this as a roadmap it didn't work in 2013 i um, mean nathan can speak to this more but uh when you know david coombs her attorney was defending chelsea in the court martial he made it very clear that this was not any part of the defense that could hold up. And the prosecution really didn't go that hard at this. It's incredible to me that the prosecution against Julian Assange is not only recycling a case against uh, that, that was used against Chelsea Manning and recycling it to use it against the journalist in this case, but it's also going even a step further to then use this most wanted leaks list as a way to go after C. Manning. And like I said, it doesn't match up. We heard the defense go through each of these sets that were released, which for people who are following along, just to make sure everyone understands what we're discussing, 
We're talking about the Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, the U.S. state embassy cables, the detainee assessment briefs, and we're talking about these rules of engagement files that were disclosed along with the collateral. The defense very meticulously went through in such a way to make sure that the judge understood that all of these files had their own reasons for being disclosed. The motivation that Chelsea Manning had was not connected to Julian Assange, was not connected to whatever Julian Assange wanted to accomplish. It was all about what Chelsea Manning wanted to do alone. This is her agency. But as you can hear in the prosecution's argument, the entire time that they're making these statements in court, they have to remove agency from Chelsea Manning. They have to say Julian Assange is this anti-American, hostile, hacktivist person who wants to destroy intelligence agencies. You know, we know Mike Pompeo calls WikiLeaks this non-state hostile intelligence agency. So they treat WikiLeaks like a organization that's at war with the United States. And to them, Chelsea Manning's a recruit who can't think for herself. And even today, while she sits in a jail cell in Alexandria, Virginia, having uh, tallied up over $325,000 in fines because of her resistance, having been in jail for um, hundreds of days now, uh, we're fast approaching the year long, the, the, the date that marks a year in her resistance, they still believe that that is not something she's doing on her own, that she has been put up to this and is doing it to serve Assange and WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. And even if we accepted the, um, I guess, U.S. government's timeline of events, it, it makes out, or the their portrayal of it, it, it makes it out that the act of Julian Assange seeking information which they term it as like soliciting as something that's illegal but you know uh, this has come up plenty of times is that this is no different than what journalists do every single day right it is you know even if Ch you know Chelsea Manning didn't have agency and it was uh, Julian egging her on or, or whatever it's that doesn't make it any more criminal right uh, yeah that, that would be totally so, fair yeah and to be clear, we learned that she was trying to access video games. Can one of you explain that in a greater depth? I know that that was sort of a, uh, a misconception. Sure, yeah. Uh, if I could give a quick little context first. Uh, so Assange is, tra is charged under 18 counts. 17 of them are espionage. And the 18th is a uh, co conspiracy to commit co computer intrusion. And while this has been talked about by the DOJ as a hacking charge and by others as just a computer charge, uh, it's really a conspiracy charge that kind of unlocks the other 17. Because uh, as Kevin was saying, it's really the, the key element to this whole narrative of Assange coaching and working with and trying to get more from Chelsea Manning uh, throughout her time. Uh, it's, it's very important that the US and Chelsea Manning uh, disagree on the timeline they say that she started way back in 2009, uh, when she says that she started in 2010. Um, uh, but yeah, so the hacking charge, the allegedly hacking charge, is uh, uh, what we talked about at length yesterday in court. And the defense explained that, uh, so our common understanding has been that uh, Julian Assange attempted to help, Ass help Chelsea Manning crack a password to use an admin username in an, a database that she already had access to otherwise. Um, and so they claim that this would help her use, these, use this data database and continue to steal documents anonymously. Uh, but what the defense explained today was that that wouldn't ha anonymize her, that wouldn't help her uh, do anything more secretively, um, because uh, the military tracks computer usage by IP address, and the computer would have the same IP address no matter what username you use. Um, and so what they explained that gave context is that Chelsea Manning was uh, just a soldier in a fob uh, in an army base and kind of bored in Iraq and uh, would listen to music She um, and played video games. And so she was uh, trying to use a different uh, username to download video games to her computer just the way that several other soldiers were doing. Mm -hmm. And 
it was said that this was a very common practice amongst a lot of soldiers. It wasn't just Chelsea men. I think one of her superiors actually asked her to uh, <laughs> install <laughs> software on her computer. So yeah. she was seen as a technical expert among the her peers. The fascinating thing about this woman is she's the one who stood up on the witness stand during the trial. Nathan probably remembers this and attacked Chelsea Manning's patriotism. Yeah. And meanwhile, she's encouraging her, uh, I guess, Inferior. someone she oversees to engage in what is actually a crime. To break the law. <laughs> it's yeah. actually a crime. Yeah. Mm. What, sorry, I just want to say that what I found the most shocking today, since you were asking um, earlier, is that none of these arguments were at all countered by the prosecution today. And it gave me the feeling that actually they probably won't be. Their tactic or their strategy is probably to avoid entering into any of these debates or, you know, just simply because all of this is on the public record. It's very difficult to, to counter these arguments. There's a lot of evidence. So I think their strategy is simply to focus, to hone in on those one or two very technical legal details and to keep, to try to sort of push the, the entire conversation in that or keep it maintained in that corner and not even to let it go to completely ignore all these all these arguments and um, I was quite sort of yeah shocked and saddened by that because that's going to make it very difficult um, if if there's no need to even counter these very strong some of the arguments I, f I found by the defense yesterday were extremely strong and I would have loved to hear what the prosecution was going to say about them. Yeah, in several different areas, the U.S. is just very selective about what they decide to focus on, and that's their method of misinterpreting the whole narrative. And so it's definitely m far more enlightening to hear Chelsea Manning's uh, chronology than the selective parts of the prosecution. Uh, that came up a few times, their selectivity. Like yesterday, what was in amazing to me at the end of the day is after the defense put forward all of this information that, as you say, you should respond to, we then get this cop-out answer to what we just heard that these were all just general allegations, that the most wanted leaks list is in the general allegations part of the indictment, and so they're not trying to link it to any specific disclosures. And what I try to do in my reporting is go back over the indictment and show that, in fact, the most wanted leaks list is connected in the indictment to the war logs, to the cables, and that they're saying that, that because she saw the list, she's making this disclosure. But I think that's an example of the way the prosecution is trying to use, uh, change, they're altering the meaning of language before the judge as a way to muddy everything and make it possible for them to get Julian Assange to the United States. I want to make a quick point here about what is happening with the UK prosecutors in general. Their goal and what they have to do for the United States is get Julian Assange to U.S. soil. And once we see Julian Assange in U.S. soil, hypothetically, Obviously, we don't want him to end up in the United States. But once he does get there, if he's there, we're in uncharted territory. And to some degree, what they are making uh, a bones of contention in these proceedings, he may not be able to raise under the Espionage Act in the United States. Well, first off, we've never had a journalist prosecuted under the Espionage Act in the United States. But... I will remind people who have some familiarity about whistleblowers that it's a strict liability offense and Assange would be extremely limited in being able to describe his motivations and his intent when he published these documents. And we don't really know. We haven't heard anything litigated or argued in these proceedings during this week about the First Amendment issue. And I don't know that we will. But it's possible that the carve-out, the way to get around issues, the freedom of speech issues in the United States, is if we prove that, prove that it happened, then that's what we have to do is just prove that it happened. 
and then you criminalize the conduct and it doesn't matter what Julian Assange thinks and in fact the best that Julian Assange can do is what Chelsea Manning did is find some way to get a statement into the court proceedings so that the public can hear from him why he did what he did but he shouldn't have to explain because he's a journalist and there should be press freedom. Yeah, before we do get into uh, the First Amendment in particular and how this case is very serious and will not only impact journalists, but impact just average citizens and uh, impact their right to know, uh, I think it's really important when talking about this case. Many people can hear about it and think, oh, I'm not a journalist. This won't impact me. It certainly does. It certainly does. Um, but I want to thank everybody uh, who's watching right now. Uh, thank you for watching us. We just uh, started to do this podcast because we are covering the Assange extradition hearings in London. And then also make sure you do retweet the link so we can get more people watching this so we can expose more people to this information. We know that um, oftentimes this is not uh, discussed in, in corporate media. It is more so now. But um, we're really getting into depth here. And the, we are... I'm with people right now who are in the courtroom, uh, so they know firsthand exactly what happened. Um, I would like to get maybe some of your thoughts in here as well with the First Amendment and um, the, the assault on the free press that is at stake here. I could just say a little bit more about what Kevin was talking about, the, uh, the fact that defendants under the Espionage Act uh, are not allowed to present any public interest defense or explain their motives. Meanwhile, the government gets to say, uh, whatever they want about the motives on the other hand. So they get to paint Manning uh, and especially Assange over these last couple of days as someone with in really reckless disregard for what will happen if he publishes these informa this information. And so um, we haven't talked about it that much yet, but that was a big focus of yesterday's hearing as well. Was the um, So in 2010, November of 2010, WikiLeaks began uh, releasing Cablegate, the State Department cables. 250,000 of them, but it just began. It didn't release all of them. It was working with a series of media partners to, uh, in a very specifically, uh, Julian Assange has said, is a harm minimization pro process. Uh, WikiLeaks even uh, would work with these organizations to redact information, uh, even using a script to uh, automatically, like robotically, uh, redact all names just to protect sources who could potentially be named. Um, but then in Fast forward to September 2011, and this is how the government would have it. Doesn't really matter what happens in between. Is that just fast forward September 2011? Uh, WikiLeaks publishes the unredacted file of all 250,000 cables. Um, but what happens in between is incredibly important. And as you were saying, the selectivity here is really dangerous and super misrepresenting of of the facts. Uh, what actually happened was, as we talked about in court. Um, so one of the media partners WikiLeaks was working with, with in 2010 was The Guardian. And uh, David Lee and Luke Harding uh, worked with WikiLeaks on those 2010 disclosures and together wrote, wrote a book in, that was published in February 2011. So they're making money themselves personally off of these leaks. Um, and we learned that one of the chapter titles of that book was a password to an uh, encrypted file that had all of the unredacted cables. And they put that password on the, the chapter title of the book, published the book with no double checking of, oh, maybe I should check that password won't release 250,000 cables. Can I just um, quickly say it was a very interesting moment in court, actually, because when, right. when that came up, the prosecution lawyer didn't even know that that was the case. Did not know that. And the defense showed him the book, and he kind of he was incredulous. He was like, <laughs> what, really? And I was yeah. Because that's been public knowledge for people right. that have followed this, but I thought that was a really extraordinary moment. Right. But sorry. No, so uh, th February 2011 was when that book was published, that password was published. Uh, luckily, people didn't put it two and two together for a while. It was kind of a complicated uh, way to figure out how that password should be used. But in August 2011, somebody did figure that out and made that known to WikiLeaks uh, and to others. And others began mirroring WikiLeaks site and posting the unredacted cables. Um, as soon as WikiLeaks found out, as soon as Assange found out, um, they went, sprang right into action, warning people about this. And Julian Assange himself called the White House, and Sarah Harrison called the State Department, uh, working for WikiLeaks called the State Department, uh, saying, like, this is an emergency. The people are, Assange specifically said, lives are at risk here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was 
told that he had the uh, the emergency line to the White House to the U.S. government, and then was told, well, "Just call back in a couple hours, and you know we'll get we'll get to it." Uh, and he said he was incredulous himself, saying, "Like, I don't understand why you don't have urgency here. People's lives are at risk." Um, uh, the U.S. government does, certainly doesn't want that in the record. Doesn't want that discussed. So, yeah, again, very selective about what they choose to focus on. And, and and the interesting thing is that not only is all this stuff on the public record and very easily sort of searchable and findable, but this is actually you know, this whole scene of him calling um, mm. the State Department and uh, or the White House and Sarah Harrison doing that is in Laura Potras from right, it's um, on video, Risk. Yeah. So it's all, it's mm -hmm. you, you can just watch it on Netflix. It's on Netflix now. Anyone can see it. Like the, the evidence is so readily available, and the fact that the prosecution was sort of surprised by it, or surprised by, it, or at least appeared to be surprised by that chronology, was kind of. Um, when, yeah. when that came up in court, I kind of noticed on Twitter some other journalists who had worked with WikiLeaks at the time in 2010 said that they personally attested to Assange's. Uh, deep caring for uh, for minimizing harm. He's cared very seriously about redactions and not putting people innocent people's lives at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were attesting to that on Twitter, you know, live as this was going on. Uh, so. And I think this is again probably not public knowledge to people that follow this, but it was mentioned in the court how the WikiLeaks redaction process was so thorough that it was actually more thorough than some of the Pentagon's own redaction when things had come out. Uh, through FOIA requests and, and things of that nature. Right, yeah, they redacted more than the government did, more mm -hmm. than other media organizations did, but uh, that's not what the government wants to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I guess in terms of other misconceptions that um, are worth correcting, as we talked a little bit about the most wanted list, um, we kind of had a long discussion yesterday of how, um, you know, what was on that list and what um, Manning had provided to Assange was completely different. Um, documents that WikiLeaks had wanted uh, were not received, and um, vice versa. So that I think you know that's that's worth. But more than that, they, they it was not even a, something that WikiLeaks put out. It's like this is exactly what we want. That was that's why WikiLeaks w is called a wiki. Mm -hmm. uh, it's collaborative. Uh, anyone and they invited journalists and human rights defenders and activists. You know, put on this list what you want. What would be really useful for your work and and giving the public uh, better access to what it's gov what your government is doing. And so it, it was a collaborative effort. Other people were putting that on. It's not Assange mm -hmm. specifically asking for certain documents. It's mm -hmm. a collaborative thing. And, and that sorry, uh, just very quickly about the interesting thing about the, well, two points about the points of omission is that we had a very good point on our discussion in mo on Monday is that we hear a lot about, you know, uh, the amount of harm that uh, Julian Assange allegedly put people in. We never actually have a discussion about um, the amount of war crimes that were disclosed, or you know, that in relation to one another is is a very stark contrast, isn't there? Um, I forgot the other point I was going to make, so I'm going to hand it. I off. was very glad you saw me yeah. kind of reaching for the mic. <laughs> I just wanted to build off of some of the points that you were making as well. At least in the um, early days of WikiLeaks, I believe that it had to rely on other media partners, essentially, to get the information out there, not just uh, collaborators, but also they relied on the media to report on these leaks. And just for everybody who's watching, uh, if you don't already know this, I know many people that follow the case do, but um, WikiLeaks has a 100% accuracy rate in reporting and also are very dedicated to source protection and helping whistleblowers. And um, we have the director of Courage Foundation uh, with us as well, which is a great organization. And I'd like you to talk about that uh, before we wrap up later on. And I talked about the uh, series of events that you guys held in the United States, which were awesome. And uh, maybe there will Thanks be some coming. more of them. Yes, I attended two of them. They were great. And it was interesting also during these events to hear from people who knew uh, Julian personally, who know him, and who uh, spent quite a bit of time with him and said that he was a person of high moral integrity. And then that really is reflected in how he and others working for WikiLeaks, other staff members, took the time to make sure that these names were redacted to minimize uh, potential harm. I, I, I was just thinking that one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet is that the US government was actually involved in the redaction mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. and that was a very strong argument as well. Yeah. Um, uh, 
that do, that isn't mentioned a lot. And and two of the journalists that were involved with the Spiegel at the time, um, they gave a talk at the Bundestag at the German Parliament um, and and tes testified to how strict WikiLeaks um, was about protecting protecting sources and about the whole redaction process. And actually, John Goetz, who was also mentioned a lot yesterday, he at that time said that how annoyed he and the others were and that they would talk <laughs> about WikiLeaks badly um, because they were so strict about encryption and about all this stuff, which you know now it seems totally normal, but at the time it seemed totally, they thought it was completely paranoid and totally over the top how you know, strict they were about trying to protect this data and trying to, you know, not let it go out into the world unredacted. So it's, yeah. And I think the point that you just raised about how the uh, U.S. State Department was helping with the redactions, uh, I guess, can lead us on to a very good point of, I think the main thing that came out of yesterday was that um, the, the, the U.S. prosecution or the indictment uh, it was made. The case was made by the defense that it's willfully um, misconstrues the the facts of the case, and it, that is a very good example of that. Is that WikiLeaks were actually uh, State Department was helping WikiLeaks in in the redaction, so to kind of make the claim that WikiLeaks is recklessly putting lives at risk is knowingly untrue because they were they were involved in that process. And the government's argument was that uh, you can't talk about that. You just have to look at what's in the extradition request. Don't even look at the indictment, just what's in the extradition request, the way it's phrased. And, uh, and so really trying to limit what the judge can look at in this case and try to really narrow it, make that decision harder for her. And, and I found sometimes almost rude the way um, the prosecution was telling the judge, you know, this is not your jur jurisdiction. <laughs> all you have to decide on is what, like, basically saying this, all of this is none of your business. You have, you know, nothing to say on all this. Leave that up to us. He'll have a fair trial in America. All you need to decide is whether or not he can be extradited and ignore all, you know, right. all, all this All they want, want them to look at is what's called dual criminality. If it's a crime in the, U in the U.S., is it also a crime in the U.K.? That's mm -hmm. all they want them to look at. But what the defense is arguing is that it so misrepresents the facts, that so misconstrues things as to constitute an abuse of process. And so that's mm -hmm. the way that they're challenging this extradition so far. Mm -hmm. and and they, sorry. Well, and then from that, what extends is they're making the argument that Julian Assange is in Belmarsh prison, denied bail, and so he's arbitrarily detained and his rights, his due process rights are being violated because you have put forward an indictment that is false, improper, uh, and you know plays fast and loose with the facts, and and in doing so, only because you're doing that, are you able to justify keeping him in prison? Only by doing that, are you able to convince the judge that Julian Assange should be in prison, not out on bail, and uh, and, and so without that, uh, you know, this has been really why we're, we're, we're trapped in this kind of a case. I think one thing that may be important to uh, clarify here is who has the uh, burden to show evidence, like what side does. I'm not sure if the standard is proof, but is it up to the defense to show that this uh, extradition should not happen? Well, so the defense framed it as they're bringing an abuse of process allegation against this request. So they're saying that um, the judge should decide on whether the request itself is abusive in its nature by misrepresenting the facts. Among There are several factors, but one of them is, is how willfully it misrepresents the facts. So it's framed as, um, and actually that's interesting, the judge asked, like, what do you want me to rule on here uh, early on in the court? And one of the things was whether this is an abuse of process. And um, I guess one thing that um, was relevant to that was, um, what's my point there? But mm, the the one of the things that came out about the abuse of process was, oh, I'm completely losing my point here. You're going to have to. Um, <laughs> I could go Maybe back to. Maybe if you could. Yeah, why don't you pick it up? I just want to say something about that you mentioned earlier that I think should get a lot more attention is that we never get focus on what WikiLeaks disclosed on the yeah. war crimes. And I was so glad that yesterday we actually heard about collateral murder as a war crime, as, uh, and the defense described it as a genuinely chilling video. 
and we finally, I mean, this isn't the proper way, it should be doing it in The Hague, but finally we get U.S. war crimes mentioned uh, in a courtroom here. Uh, and so, uh, as Kevin was saying, it's, it's amazing how the government wants to paint uh, Assange as just the coach who used Chelsea Manning as a pawn, basically completely denying her whistleblowing agency when structured their statements to the court, they're reminding or perhaps informing the judge for the first time. We don't know. I don't know what kind of knowledge she has of WikiLeaks disclosures and publications and, and the kind of impact it had on the world. Welcome back, everyone. You are watching The Watchdog Live. Uh, sorry about that little glitch. Of course, this is live television. You can expect uh, things like that to go wrong at some point. But we are back. And make sure that you do retweet this link. Make sure you subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and that you also follow us on Twitter at WD Newswire. So I do want to pick it back up where we left off. Kevin, I know you were uh, making a point, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. And I won't start from the middle. I'll just say that Edward uh, Fitzgerald was uh, is the defense attorney for Assange, and he stood in the court and said something to the effect of, how can you be accused of committing treason in the United States if you're not a U.S. citizen? And I think it's important because before we had the glitch, we were talking about what makes WikiLeaks a unique media organization. And, and for one, it's true that they're non-state, uh, that's the only accurate part of what Mike Pompeo says because they have, but they've always celebrated being a stateless news organization. And what happens all the time, and I think why we need to talk about this idea of how can you commit treason against the United States if you're not a U.S. citizen, is because for the most part, a lot of the criticism in the U.S. press, but I think it also filters out and leaks into the global press is that he's anti-American and and it and a lot of the criticism against him and the way that they try to smear and assassinate his character comes from the way in which he aligns himself with countries or people who are considered enemies of the state to the US government and he's under no obligation to not speak to these people I mean as a person who is an Australian and again, like even if his government doesn't want him to talk to these people, we still should talk about principles of freedom of association, of being able to have these kinds of interactions. But there's nothing that says, you know, he can't go on Russia Today to do an interview, to have a broadcast. There's nothing that says that he can't align himself with these different countries. There's nothing to say that he can't have uh, uh, a relationship with Rafael Correa in Ecuador because the U.S. doesn't like that Rafael Correa runs a left-wing government and says that you can't have a U.S. military base in Ecuador. But I think a lot of the way in which Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have been willing to oppose what the U.S. wants in its foreign policy agenda. Again, not to say that WikiLeaks is only entirely focused on opposing uh, the U.S., but in, in my view, I kind of feel like a lot of the way we view WikiLeaks is colored entirely by the way the U.S. has attacked WikiLeaks. So they're actually pushing it in. So, you know, we've hear, heard a lot in the last couple, uh, in the last four to five years about whether or not they were provided information from Russian intelligence, and that was how we got the DNC emails that sh revealed all of this information about how uh, the DNC was stacking its primaries against Bernie Sanders, or let's put it another way, anointing Hillary Clinton the candidate for the Democratic Party. And you know, the reason why sources may be somewhat connected to that region of the world might reach out to WikiLeaks is because WikiLeaks is being pushed into a direction where they're seen as an opposition force to the United States. And I think one thing that the prosecution will never grapple with, but should have to reckon with, out le at least outside of court proceedings, is how U.S. policy has turned WikiLeaks into an organization that they view as their opponent. 
because I think it wasn't WikiLeaks that decided to challenge the U.S. It was the United States that decided to challenge WikiLeaks. I thought there was, a, on the first day, there was kind of a revealing slip of the tongue by the government. They said, uh, instead of saying send him to the U.S., they said return him to the U.S. <laughs> yeah. But he's an Australian citizen. Uh, he does not, should not have to be bound by the U.S. Espionage Act, and that's something we should really remember. This is, uh, for other reasons, a, a real danger to the U.S. First Amendment, uh, and the Espionage Act is very dangerous for U.S. citizens. Uh, but this is a danger for citizens around the world. This is, uh, the U.S. wants to have uh, military bases around the world. It should expect that uh, people are going to push back against that around the world. Uh, and so it wants to claim that the world is, it, is the U.S. jurisdiction, that uh, any citizen anywhere, if they publish something uh, that's, that the U.S. doesn't like, the U.S. can retaliate however it wants. And then there's also this very selective choosing of which laws apply to Julian Assange and, and not. So it's like he is being accused of being treasonous, but he is not. Uh, he's not afforded the protections of the First Amendment. Right. We've seen the Espionage, <laughs> Espionage Act applies to him, but the First Amendment doesn't. Yeah. So it's just right. Which I'll just quote James Goodall, who's the former general counsel of New York Times, who I interviewed before I came to cover these proceedings in London, who you know made it very clear that yes, you can't have it both ways. If you're the if you're the government, if you're going to try him under the Espionage Act, as as Nathan just said, you get First Amendment rights. But if because he's a foreigner, the Espionage Act does not apply, apply if, in fact, U.S. secrecy laws do not apply to people who are not U.S. citizens, then, okay, then you can't prosecute him in the first place. Then you shouldn't be extraditing him at all. We also should take this moment to throw out this uh, wild uh, evolution that we might be headed towards where, and, and the defense has actually spoken about this, where various countries throughout the world that have powers are now going to enforce their own secrecy laws on people who are foreign journalists. That's what the United States is opening up. And uh, it's going to come from Russia, China, Iran, Israel. It's going to come from any of these countries. It could come from Turkey. We've seen tremendous crackdowns on people in terms of freedom of expression. It could come from European countries. Uh, it could come selectively at a moment when there are political crises in these countries. They might turn to this in order to go after somebody because it's expedient. That's what the United States is doing. They're making it more dangerous for people to be global correspondents. And we've seen the first sign of that with Glenn Greenwald in Brazil, the first sort of mm -hmm. other government basically copy and pasting the charges um, against Assange and using very similar charges against an American journalist um, in Brazil. I think that America really does uh, set the standard uh, worldwide because we often see that uh, human rights abuses in the West in America are often used to justify human rights abuses elsewhere in the world. probably going to forget my point again as soon as I start <laughs> speaking but um, the point that I was going to raise is that um, as soon as I do this I always forget what I'm going to say um, what was your point sorry about what was the point that you just made I was uh, talking about secrecy laws right um, but uh, let's uh, talk about yes, the let's uh, talk about what happened <laughs> during the so now may be a good time to <laughs> remind everybody to retweet this link and uh, also subscribe to our YouTube channel, make sure you follow us on Twitter. Again, that is at WD Newswire. We will be having uh, content posted there throughout the week, again, on this full extradition hearing. And um, for those of you who are, you know, maybe just be joining us right now, you are watching The Watchdog live. So I think that everybody kind of wants to pick up on, on something. Uh, Sarah, I will let you take it from here. Well, I, I think um, I would like to talk about what happened when Julian Assange got up and about the conditions he's being held under. Basically, there was a moment where um, the judge interrupted the proceedings to inquire about Assange's ability to follow because he seemed very sleepy and he was yawning a lot. And then he got up and basically said that he wasn't able to concentrate because he wasn't participating in any way in that in the proceedings he was I mean he's sitting in this um, glass box at the back of the court um, completely isolated from everything else he's seeing everybody just the backs of everyone's heads except for the judge 
and he's having no access or he was complaining that he was having very little access to his lawyers and that even when he does talk to them that you know he's being overheard by the prosecution and there are microphones above him and there's the two guards um, and what I found very interesting I mean first of all that is an interesting moment because talking about you know the conditions he's being held under but also I found it very interesting how the prosecution reacted and it love to hear what you guys yeah. thought of that just to give yeah it, give a little context for those who don't know what the court would look like he's in this glass box in the back of the courtroom seeing the back of everyone's heads except for the judge who's looking down at him uh, and has no meaningful communication with his legal team meaning no uh, privileged legal conversations he can only pass notes through this little uh, slit in the glass uh, between uh, the dock and the rest of the court uh, so he, it's very difficult to participate meaningfully in his own legal defense. Uh, and so he was com saying that, I, how can, you know, why even bother asking me if I can concentrate if I can't participate in this? All he could do was, was watch the proceedings uh, from behind. And so he has asked uh, through his legal team uh, to be let out of the dock and to be able to sit with his legal team. Uh, to be able to have these kind of confidential uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. And we're expecting an application for that to be made tomorrow. And I guess what's important to raise for people that are kind of new to this all is that this falls into the context of his time in the Ecuadorian embassy where we now know that he was being uh, spied on, I think, 24-7 uh, through mm -hmm. this company, UC Global. And that included the conversations that he was having with his lawyers. And I think in the hearings of in May, we're going to hear... Um, you know, completely, I think it's going to be completely brand new evidence about, um, I believe there is a worker th within the Ecuadorian embassy that's given a statement um, kind of out, uh, outlining some of this, uh, some of this spying on, on him and his legal. There are two anonymous witnesses from UC Global to talk about uh, the surveillance on Assange in the embassy. Mm -hmm. Has any of that been public on the public record before? It or? was just mentioned so far, and there's, there are Spanish proceedings underway against that security mm -hmm. uh, company, and so they've given private testimony. Uh, and so El País has covered that really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we could provide some context to the viewers right now who may not be familiar of the significance of UC Global, can you describe a little bit about that? Sure, it's a Spanish security company that was hired to uh, uh, surveil uh, initially to protect uh, Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, but uh, in 2017, when Lenin Moreno's government took over, uh, the job changed a little bit. And Morales, the head of UC Global, since her undercover global, um, uh, traveled to the United States and went to Las Vegas to a uh, security conference. And there we learned recently that he met with tr one of Trump's major financial backers, Sheldon Adelson. Uh, and he came away with a contract that was something to do with uh, providing security for Adelson's yacht. But we also know that he has a side contract to uh, surveil the Ecuadorian embassy for the U.S. intelligence services. And so they're planting microphones and, and cameras in throughout the Ecuadorian embassy, completely invading Assange's privacy, including in where he thought was the only private place to speak with his lawyers, the women's bathroom. They have cameras and, and microphones, uh, so it's an incredible intrusion that was sent to the uh, to the CIA. And while visitors were being spied on, they had to leave their phones at the front desk at the Ecuadorian embassy, and those phones were then hacked, uh, or their the batteries were tried to take it, taken. They out, would right? take them apart. They, they would just take they, them, they, take it apart. They, they would they could pull them apart. Uh, there was uh, in El País's great coverage, their Spanish newspaper that's been doing most of this coverage. Uh, astoundingly, this is not something that the U.S. press is covering, even though it is a CIA-backed espionage operation against a diplomatic embassy inside the United Kingdom. And one example in El País's coverage of how people were targeted and they were going after visitors who came in to see Julian Assange. They were going after journalists, attorneys, and they were going after any Russians that came in there. So Russians or Americans, those were like two nationalities that they were really interested in. Ellen Nakashima is a reporter for the Washington Post, and in their coverage, they say that she can, and she's, she does a lot of cybersecurity stories. I think she worked on some of the NSA stories as well. And she was in the courtroom with Nathan and I, 
when we were covering the Chelsea Manning for, for some of the days that Washington Post were covering, she came to, to do that in the first days of the coverage for that. And Ellen went to the embassy and they tried to steal her phone battery. And there's an amazing statement in the coverage from El Pais that the employee admits, I don't know why you put this in writing, but it was actually in a record that we, we, I tried to take her battery, but she came back and asked for it. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Why are you admitting that you did that? But they were, so apparently they're trying to take things that would make it possible to track journalists, but also they wanted to be able to get in so that they could turn these devices into tracking devices uh, and make it possible to follow these j journalists around. Uh, it's an astounding case. It's just, and, and there, it's an, it's an operation where uh, I, I did an interview with CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou, and he points out that the CIA got burned back in the 1970s from targeting journalists. We heard in the church committees and the Pike committees in the U.S. that, that this was something that was out of bounds. And uh, whether it's just this kind of exception to the rule, we don't, we don't truly know, but we know that there's something about WikiLeaks that has opened this can of worms where now the government is feeling like it can target journalists who went to this embassy. So the U.S. has had a window into Assange's legal strategy for years now, and so that's what he was referencing in court today, saying uh, when he wanted a privileged legal communication with his lawyers, he said, I think my lawyers have been spied on enough, and that's what he was referencing. And they have the confidential papers. Right, yep. And I think it was interesting that the judge said that she didn't feel that she had jurisdiction or had the ability to decide, make you know, a risk assessment about him to be able to get him into the court to be, you know, to sit in the court with his lawyers and basically insinuating that he's some kind of mass murderer um, uh, and where his um, defense attorney reminded her that this is an intellectual, soft-spoken man and that, you know, this mm -hmm. was probably not the case. And then that's when the interesting happened, which is when the prosecutor, um, when David Lewis stepped in and actually said that he as well thought that, you know, it should be fine for him to be in the courtroom. And he was basically defending um, Assange's <laughs> right to be in the courtroom and to have mm -hmm. access to to the proceedings and to the to his lawyers, and that's where I was thinking, you know, what 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 do you think is the reason for that? Is that a fear of a mistrial being called if the abuse gets too strong? You know, what what is the motivation behind, or does he just want to make, you know, does the pr prosecution just want to appear very nice and fair? Or? Probably both are benefits. He gets to look like oh, he's uh, very sensitive to Assange's due process concerns while putting it on the judge to, to not let him out of the dock. Um, and yeah, meanwhile, uh, depriving him of his due process rights either way. It also has no effect on whether they're able to extradite him or not. If you let him sit at the table, you know, everything's still going to unfold as it's going to unfold. I think the point that you're making is, why does it seem like the judge is the one who's more hostile to Assange than the prosecutor? And why is it she that's hearing there's a way to do this. You could have a security guard standing by him in case he would try to get up and leave. I don't know why he would do that, but in case he tried to just book it out of the courtroom and run, uh, you have a security guard there to grab him. I don't know if there's a concern that someone from the press is going to interact with Julian Assange, probably, or that somebody from the public gallery might try to have an interaction with Assange. It seems like that might be a little more difficult, but... Uh, it's in the realm of possibility for the prosecution. They don't see any reason why it couldn't be done. Um, then the judge happening in what I understand is a courthouse where counterterrorism cases are prosecuted. She's just thinking in terms of national security, and immediately it goes to her mind that we don't have this worked out with the security yet in order to figure out how to uh, manage Julian Assange, so I can't say yes to this and I can't approve it. And it wasn't really clear when we left that they knew what the defense should ask for. Uh, let's let's just, not to confuse people who are viewers, but I think it's kind of fascinating that what started out was the judge 
implying that they should make a bail application to the judge. But why? They're, that's not going to be granted, and the prosecution's just going to deny it. And we'll be back where we are. It would be a total waste of time and a total waste of court resources and the judge's time and everything because you'll have to make a ruling on it. And that's not what they're seeking. I mean, they're, I mean, yes, we don't think Julian Assange should be in Belmarsh right now. He should be out of jail and able to make his defense like any other person in these kinds of cases is typically able to do. But uh, that's not what they were asking for. They just want him to be able to sit with his attorneys and they're not giving any like straight answers of how they could pursue that fix. Tomorrow morning, we expect there will be some kind of defense submission on that. Um, don't know exactly what form it'll take. We know it won't be a bail application, <laughs> but uh, they're going to ask in some way to have him out of the dock, we expect. Yeah, actually, I was just going to ask you about um, what we can expect looking ahead before we uh, wrap up. I know we are all uh, probably pretty careful to uh, make predictions in this case or to uh, make judgments but um, if you would like to maybe just explain what we can expect for tomorrow. And then, of course, uh, for those who are watching, this is not the end of this full extradition hearing. It will The second portion of it will resume May 18th and should last about three weeks. Um, the extradition process can take a very long time. It could take uh, even years. But remember that everything is always subject to change as well as far as the scheduling. So if you could leave us off with maybe uh, what, you, what we can all expect in the coming months. And um, everybody that's watching, once again, uh, you are watching The Watchdog Live. We are a new organization. Uh, Tara Kadad uh, founded this organization. Make sure that you do uh, follow um, on Twitter at WD Newswire and also go to the website, thewatchdog.net. Just for tomorrow, yeah. So we'll hear from the defense. They'll make some kind of submission uh, about whether he could be out of the dock. Um, is what was was we left off with anyway, uh, and then the government will finish uh, the last parts of its argument, uh, opposing the defense uh, claim that this is a political offense and that should be a bar to extradition. So that'll wrap up tomorrow, and then as you say, we continue for three weeks, beginning May 18th, uh, and then we're going to have several witnesses, uh, both live and written testimony. Uh, we're going to have witnesses on the First Amendment, on the Espionage Act, uh, on uh, WikiLeaks is harm minimization process. We're going to hear kind of a lot more detail about the arguments that were fleshed out in court this week. And then also, too, uh, for our guests, please uh, quickly just let everybody know where they can find you and where they can find your work. Uh, these are the people to go to when it comes to looking for information on this case. Uh, Kevin, in particular, has been live tweeting. I myself have been uh, checking his Twitter quite frequently lately, uh, myself and many others as well. Um, so if you could start, Sarah, and just let everybody know your Twitter and where they can find your work. <laughs> so I met on Twitter since two days approximately, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to be on there a lot more, so I'm going to be starting to uh, uh, tweet a lot more. So my Twitter handle is Sarah H. Marbrook. <laughs> uh, I am with the Courage Foundation. We uh, run the public campaign uh, to defend Assange and WikiLeaks at defend.wikileaks.org, uh, and I tweet from Courage Foundation's handle at Courage Found on Twitter. And my name is Taylor Hudak. I'm an independent journalist and co-founder of Action for Assange. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at underscore Taylor Hudak. And I am Tariq underscore Haddad, and I don't like to promote myself very much, so I'll hand it over to Kevin. <laughs> I am Kevin Gastola again, and you can find me at kgostola, K-G-O-S-Z-T-O-L-A. And the reporting that I've been doing is published at shadowproof.com. And uh, thank you. So I want to thank everybody one last time uh, for watching, for tuning in. We will be holding another podcast tomorrow with some other very special guests. Uh, Tarek and I will be hosting that event again, and you could watch out for us. It'll be around 7.30 p.m. GMT time. So thank you, guys, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>